Matthew chapter 6. Bring your Bibles to church. Bring your Bibles to church. Bring your Bibles to church. Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, uh, 19 through 21. 19 through 21. The Bible says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on, upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How many of you are familiar with that scripture? You've heard that before? Good. Okay, you've all heard that before. Um, I saw Brother Stoltz. He, he, he always shares on uh, Facebook some really nice cars. You all see those before? Brother Stoltz has got a nice, uh, nice eye for cars, and he's always sharing some real nice ones. Today he shared one, and it said... Um, uh, gonna fix her up. And it was just four. Did you see that, Miss Sarah? I got a good laugh out of that. It was four tires and uh, the axle had, everything else had rusted into the ground. It was nothing. It was just, it just looked like four, ta- four cars and some rust or four tires and some rust. And there was nothing else there. It was just <laughs> gonna fix her up, you know? And I thought to myself, um, what a shame. I wonder what that was, that it sat there for so long and somebody had the thought, no, I'm going to fix that up. I've seen those, that show before, American Pickers, you know, where they, they go around and they, oh, you know, what, do you want to sell that? And they're like, oh, no, I'm going to hang on to that. And the truth of the matter is, is we do the same thing in our life. We go through and say, I'm going to fit into that shirt one day. Uh, I'm going to get into that skirt one day. No, I'm not. Uh, uh, the ladies would say that. I'm going to, and don't run with that either, Dan. Don't run with that. Brother Dan, that guy, he's vicious. He's like a viper. If you misspeak, he just attacks you. Uh, so I'm going to let him speak more and start attacking him. Uh, but no. Uh, uh, and you say, I'm going to get into that, or I'm going to use that, or that might come and hit. It's a broken shoelace. Throw it away. Uh, we say, uh, I'm going to get rid of that, or I'm going to keep that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to fix that one day. And the, we're just laying things up. Lay, they say, have you ever heard the, the, uh, uh, the quote, addition by subtraction? addition by subtraction. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, You add something to yourself by getting rid of the clutter and the things that you'd really never use and and to part away with something. Now, here's the great thing about getting rid of things. Number one, it makes you feel like, all right, I'm I'm, I'm shedding some of the excess, but then it allows you to buy something new. (laughs) I knew that some of you'd get a kick out of that. But it says, don't lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. Don't lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. So we've been instructed through the Bible, edified and taught through the Bible, uh, uh, to lay up treasures in heaven. So not on earth. You stop speaking back there. Uh, See, what's wrong is I look this way more than I look this way. Because these people behave. Huh? Huh? Oh, really? Okay, okay, gotcha. Because you want to misbehave. Come over here with the ruffians. Uh, uh, that's right, Bill. You're always m- causing trouble and misbehaving. <laughs> Bill's like, yeah, whatever, preacher. Uh, but um, uh, lay up treasures. It's okay to lay up treasures, but just do it in heaven. Lay up treasures in heaven. A treasure is something that has value. What is, what is the treasure, Lucas? Something that has value. Now, from this passage, we understand that there are two kinds of treasures. Um, I uh, I preached on this not long ago about uh, uh, the difference between wood, hay, stubble, and gold, silver, precious stones. Uh, Temporal treasures or treasures that pass away, the wood, hay, stubble. And the Bible says in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. There are... Then there are eternal treasures. Has anybody ever had your house broken into? Anybody ever had your car broken into? Or you left something somewhere and somebody stole it? That's your stuff. Somebody stole it. Well, in heaven, nobody can steal your stuff. Nobody can ever take your things. 
Rust, it doesn't exist in heaven. Moth, doesn't, they don't exist in heaven. And if they do, they don't eat stuff up. They don't ruin things. So you have the temporal and then you have the eternal that cannot be destroyed. So you have to ask, why do I need temporal treasures? If I have eternal ones, why do I need temporal ones? Why do I need these temporary things? The answer is, and here's the answer to that, so we can purchase eternal ones. You say, wait, what? I have um, uh, an understanding from Scripture and a belief that I can use my, my temporal treasures to assist me in gaining eternal treasures. So let's say I, let's say I, I purchase a, um, uh, a nice uh, F-250. Well, I need to use it to haul tables and chairs and um, things from the food bank and pick up people from church and, uh, and pick up and take people to church. And I need to use that temporal treasure for some, some way to earn me eternal treasures. Um, if I have a home, if I, have, if I buy a home, a house or an apartment or whatever the case, then Jesus needs to be the center of that home. I want to use that temporal treasure as a, an aid, an assistant to get me eternal, to get myself, um, uh, uh, to earn myself eternal treasures. Uh, why do we need to earn money? What's the point of that? Of course, it's our society, um, so we can pay the bills, so to speak. But why do we need to earn money? I'll tell you why. So we can do the will of God. The will of God is for you to pay your bills, and the will of God is you to support a missionary, and the will of God is for you to uh, uh, tithe, to tithe. The will of God is for you to um, uh, uh, be a good steward with the money that you have. The reason to have money and earn money, of course, is to, like I said, to live. It's not plausible. It's not. It does, especially if you have a family. Um, I guess if you were a single guy or gal, you could turn into a nomad and just kind of drift throughout the United States and live. Uh, a, a very peculiar lifestyle, which many people do, by the way, of their own choosing. Um, uh, uh, but uh, it, God wants us to do his will. Why do we need to earn money? So I can rear my family in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I need money, not just to uh, go to amusement parks and go on vacations. Jamie and I are trying to uh, plan a uh, our 15-year anniversary. We've never uh, have uh, done something uh, big. It's always been a few day getaway. Um, if she just stopped having kids, we would. Be <laughs> yeah, we'd be able to get away, you know. Uh, no, truly, though, truly, we would like to do something. Our 15th uh, year anniversary, we'd like to do something um, uh, somewhat substantial. Uh, that's why I'm um, getting her a job at the moment. So she. <laughs> Uh, um, so anyway, we need, uh, uh, we don't need money just to have fun in life, but we also, uh, uh, but also to have fun while I'm obeying the will of God. You see, having fun is not separated from the will of God. So many people think, well, if I want to have fun, I can't do it, you know, in the will of God. No, you just have a carnal, wicked, sinful idea of what fun is. That's all that is. You need to change your idea about what fun is. Let me tell you something, adults, and I know that thousands of people have seen some of these videos grow up. When you become an adult, it's time to put away kitty little things and childlike thinking and, and um, uh, what brings about fun. Uh, and, you know, and you know as much as I do, it's not fun. And, uh, and if you do think it's fun, you'll go far enough to go, where's the end? When does, what's the next gear? And you'll find that there isn't one. And uh, you'll, you'll finally come to the realization and no, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's the same old repetitive, repetitive high and the same old repetitive buzz and the same old repetitive music with the repetitive women and the repetitive men and the same old friends. And you'll say, you know what? This seems kind of repetitive. I need something new. I need something different. If you want to have a challenging life and a life that bears a lot of fruit and an actual fun life, become an obedient, a scripturally obedient Christian because you'll get everything from blessings to cursings. You say, cursings from God? No, from going and telling people who you are and what you're about and having people slam doors in your face. Now, that's not always fun, but it's living on the edge. It's living on the edge. You know, there are 
millions of people in this country smoking and drinking and getting high and getting buzzed and getting wasted and OWI and DUIs and DWIs and popping all the pills and doing all their thing and sleeping with all kinds of different people and doing all kinds of wicked things. Uh, uh, There's millions of them. But there's very few who go out and knock on doors and tell people about Jesus Christ. And I don't mean the Jehovah's Witness. The Bible says another gospel. If they preach unto you another gospel, the Mormons have another gospel. The Jehovah's Witness have another gospel. Catholics have another gospel. The Muslims have another gospel. Paul said, let them be anatha maranatha. Let them be damned to hell if they come to you preaching another gospel. That's it. Thank you. That's all. That's it. So, But I'm talking about the tried and true, the real, the real deal gospel that says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works of any man should boast. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God, the Bible says that if you come to God, any man that comes to God, he will in no wise cast out. For if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The the, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the jailer, uh, the Roman jailer, who said, man, I'm going to fall on my sword. Philippian jailer. Man, my ears just popped. The Philippian jailer uh, who said, um, uh, uh, man, there's an earthquake. The prisoners went free. I'm falling on my sword because I, if, if uh, the boss man comes around and finds out that all the, the prisoners are gone on my watch, they're going to kill me anyway. I'd rather die at my hand. So here he is getting ready to fall on his own sword. And Paul calls out to him, sir, do thyself no harm. We're all here. And he knew why they were in prison. And he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thine house and thou shalt be saved. No, thou shalt be saved and thine house. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. John Harper was a, 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 a Baptist preacher when the Titanic, he was a passenger on the Titanic when it, got, when it was struck and went down. That's the story of the Titanic. There is no other story that goes with it. There's, it didn't go any, that's it. He was on the ship when it went down, and as he, he sunk into those or jumped into those icy waters or, or stayed until the last moment, and he, he ended up in those icy waters, he would swim around to people saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe, 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 believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what it's all about. That's what this is all about. So, so uh, uh, that's what we need. That's what the money is for. That's what it's for is for the, the will of God, whether it's through the bus ministry, through a jail ministry, through a nursing home ministry, through our Sunday school departments, through the nurseries, through the maintenance and the grounds and the PA and the, and the multimedia and the janitorial and the preaching and everything that it comes down to is the gospel. The gospel, and not just some gospel, not a gospel, but the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I need money. You need money and not just to have fun and go on vacations and go to amusement parks and and um, uh, uh, have a, a right kind of uh, 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 just have fun, but to have the right kind of fun while I'm obeying the will of God for my life. Then you can lay down at night and, and say, I, I don't have any guilt. There's no guilt accompanied with Christ-like fun. Uh, uh, Why do we need temporal treasures? Why do we need them? Is to lay them up, let them rust, allow the moths and the thieves and people to steal them and ruin them? No, no. I need to take my temporal treasures and invest them into eternal treasures. I think that everything that we own and possess now, if we offer it up to God and say, God, these things are not mine. My wife is not mine. She is borrowed. She's your child, Lord. My children are my, not mine. They're borrowed. They've been given to me. My wife has been given to me. My children have been given to me. My health has been given to me. Uh, a few, about a month ago or, or, or a month and a half ago, I broke out in these, these red hives just everywhere. And man, it was, I, they wouldn't go away. I had them several days. What in the world? So it was a Sunday night. I had to go to the work the next day, and I'm like, I cannot drive like this. I can't, can't do this. She said, go to the doctor. So I went to the ER up here on a state Coliseum, and I went in, and um, they took all these things, but they took my heartbeat. My heartbeat was 49 beats a minute. That's something that I'm proud of. And I found out that's either something really bad or something 
pretty good. I'm like, all right, a 49, he, your heart rate is so low. We need to redo that. I said, no, that's, that's about right. And he said, what, what is that about? Why? And here I, this is, these, these are just, I'm bragging on myself for a moment, but I'll get to a point. Um, it, it's the way that I try to keep somewhat healthy because I like food, amen, and I have to combat that. Um, uh, is um, uh, I like to lift weights. I like, I like heavy stuff. It's a challenge. I like to move it. I did, um, um, what would you call it? Jimmy, what would we call it at the gym? A, um, where you do one back to back to back. Like, um, like a burnout cycle or something like that where it's, um, you put three of them and you don't take a rest in between. So I put, um, uh, I put weight on the bench press, weight on the deadlift bar, and weight on the, the, the back squat. All the same weight. It's three pounds. Uh, all the same weight. All the same weight. And I, and I, did, um, I, I did three rounds of eight reps each time. Uh, and I would take a rest, a 60 second rest in between each set. So, um, so I'd uh, do one exercise, jump up, go to the next one, drop that, go to the next one, park that, and then take a 60 second rest and then jump right back into it. It's good for your heart to be under pressure. And I said, man, I, I, a strong heart. He said, and I, I bragged on myself to the doctor. I said, yes, strong heart. You know, I, I lift weights, blah, blah, blah. He said, it could be something else. <laughs> But he said his words were to begin with were, what's wrong with your heart? And I told him, I said, you're the doctor. You're supposed to tell me. And he got a laugh, you know, we got a laugh out of that. And I said, no, I, I do, you know, uh, I like to call it power lifting, but it's not quite powerful anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, I like to lift weights and I like to move because why? It's not my health. I've got to manage it some way, somehow. Some way, somehow, and you try to eat right, you try to do right. But my finances, my dollars are not my dollars. They're his, all of them. We all say that uh, uh, 10% belongs to God. No, that's all that he asks. 100% is his. 100%. So it's all his. Uh, but I want to take the temporal and use it wisely as a good steward for the eternal, for the eternal. So if we were to balance all the areas of our life, we have to place proper value proper value on things that are really valuable, really valuable. The things that are in our life that are really valuable are not our watch collection. Sure, monetary, but do you know what's valuable? Your relationships are valuable. Your health is valuable. Those things are valuable. I saw a sign that said, I, I can't remember if it was at a chiropractor or um, uh, at a gym, uh, but it basically it said we, we, uh, we spend our youth gaining our wealth only to get older and spend our wealth to try to regain our youth. Uh, and I thought, goodness gracious. I said, Lord, I know that I'm not an exception to a rule. I was like, but your word is exception to the rules of man. God's words and God's promises are the exceptions to the laws of man. You know, God can keep you young. God can give you Wealth when you're young and health when you're old. And vice versa. God can get, God, God, it's God who dictates it. God can make those things work out. So if we balance the areas in our life, uh, we have to place the proper value on the things that are actually valuable. Now, I want you to hear this statement. You should open your ears and hear this statement. God is the appraiser of all things. God, I'll say it again, God is the appraiser of all things, and the Bible is the appraisal book. God is the appraiser of all things. God is the appraiser of all things, and the Bible is his appraisal book. The Bible tells us what's important. I've wanted to know what my car was worth, so I went to something called KBB. It's Kelly Blue Book. And I've went to car gurus and I've went to um, all these places who say, tell us about your car. And I type in all these things about my car and they say, estimated on the information that you gave us, your car is worth so much. If you look up housing prices, of course, they're all skyrocketed right now. But God is the appraiser of all things in life. And the Bible lists what those important things are, what those valuable things are. So from houses and land and money and family and even love, God tells us how important these things are. All things, all things are placed in the word of God so we can find out what their value is. 
I want to know what some things, uh, when you get life insurance, they say list all your assets. They want to know how valuable you are. Man, I was so broke I had to lie on that thing. <laughs> I'm so unvaluable. I am so invaluable. I'm invaluable. I am so, um, uh, uh, I had to start, um, are we talking Monopoly? You know, uh, uh, Sims or whatever, some video game where you can build things, you know? Oh, I own a mansion, you know? <laughs> So if we, if, we have our, if we want our property to be appraised or our home to be appraised, we find an appraiser, someone who will tell us the value of our, uh, of our property. We did that uh, uh, just a, a, a couple of years ago where we had a realtor come in and tell us, hey, your church is valued or estimated at this value. So you may have a piece of jewelry. You may have a baseball card collection. Uh, you may have... Um, uh, uh, who knows, a family heirloom, coins, uh, different things like that, all that can be a, a appraised and they have a value. So the word of God appraises everything in our life, absolutely everything. Uh, the Bible gives us the value of a soul. Did you know that? The Bible tells us what the value of a soul is. It's the only book, the Bible is, that gives you the value of a soul. There's no other book in all of the world that has ever existed that can tell you what a human soul is worth. To society, the, uh, the man living under the bridge, his soul isn't worth much. Uh, the, um, uh, the woman who lives in Section 8 because you know, she's having a hard time uh, uh, preparing and fending for herself, and uh, the man who, who was with her left her. And, and, and by the way, not every woman that's on her own are angels, but I think if men were more godly, then the women would be more angelic. Um, uh, 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 but people who are, are the deplorables and the throwaways and, and the trash, you know, the problem kids in school and the, the guy who can't keep a job and the woman who's, who she's not so attractive and so beautiful and the world tells her the more pretty you are and the more curves that you have in the right places and the more symmetrical your face is, the more value you have. So uh, uh, they, they may look on the skin, they may look on the value, they may look on the clothes, but God looks on the soul. To mankind, we don't know what a soul is worth, but the Bible tells us what a soul is worth. The Bible says, for what shall it, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Bible is the appraisal book of life. It says that a soul is worth more than the entire world. One soul is worth more than the entire world. Now, folks, if we want to give ourselves over to, how could a church call itself a church and not be interested in souls? That a Three Rivers Baptist Church better never, ever, ever get its eye off of what is really valuable. What is really valuable? Souls. Folks, I want us to have a great department, every department. I want it to be great. I want it to run right. I want it to be straight as an arrow and, and a, a function like a, a well, a, a well-oiled machine and efficiency and power and prayer. But if we don't keep the nucleus of our church soul winning, then all the departments, then none of the departments matter. Then we're no different than the, than the, the artsy church downtown. We're no different. Just because we carry the King James Bible doesn't mean jack squat if we don't put it to use. Just because we have the old-fashioned songs and hymns and spiritual songs that bring real worship and real praise to the Lord, they don't mean anything if we're not singing them from our heart. There's, what's the point? What's the, so, many, so many Christians will die for the tradition of old-fashionedness. But if that old-fashionedness doesn't go back to the, Pentecost, the, the, the day of Pentecost, where every, every tongue, just about every tongue had heard the gospel, what is the old, how old-fashioned do we want to get? Uh, we could go further back. What would we'll say? Pentecost. Because that's New Testament, New Testament church. That's when it all started with the church becoming formed after Jesus Christ had ascended. Well, we could go back. How about, how about back, back to the birth of Christ? Because the Bible says that he came to save sinners. That's what he came for. If the purpose of Jesus was to come to save sinners and then he handed off that commission to us, why would we ever try to do anything else? Why would we ever try to do anything else? We've got to keep the nucleus of our church souls. 
Souls are the most valuable thing. Now, uh, uh, the world does not appraise a soul at the same value that Jesus does. The Bible says, for scarcely, for scarcely, and you know what that word scarcely means? Scarcely, very few, in, but very not consistent, scarce. Food is scarce, which means there's not a lot of it. It's hard to find. He says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. There's not a whole lot of people looking to lay down their lives for righteous people, let alone sinners. Get this verse. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some will even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not only was I not righteous, and was I not, and was not I, and not, and I was not, here I am. <laughs> I'm not even, a, I'm not a good speaker. Um, um, not only was I not righteous, and not only was I not good, but I, I was, I was, it says it right here. He, he, he gave his love toward us. Why? Because I was a sinner. I wasn't righteous. I wasn't even good. I was a sinner. But Christ died for me. Get this. Doesn't it make sense that God would die for who we estimate would be good and righteous? Wouldn't that make sense that why would God die for like the, the bad and the unholy? Because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are deeper than our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. I'm so glad that Jesus loves me. I'm so glad that Jesus died for unrighteous and, un and, and ungood and not good people. I'm so glad that God died for the bad and the wicked. I'm glad die God died or Jesus Christ died for us. I'm so glad Jesus died for my sins because I couldn't do it. I, there's no way I could pay it. He did it. God said, I love you so much. I, only Jesus could pay for you. So there are not very many people, but get this, there's not a whole lot of people who are worth dying for in our estimation. I got to tell you right now that I think the only people that I would die for on this earth are my wife and kids. I wouldn't expect any of you to die for me. Now, as, my, as the pastor, shouldn't I say, I'd be willing to die for my flock? Um, I suppose. But the best thing that I can do for my flock is to die to self. But I mean, physically, I don't, there's nobody I love more than my wife and children. I mean, God aside. But there's nobody I, I love. And of course, running right up would be my direct family members. I mean, they're, die, die? There's not, and, and there's not a whole lot of people you yourself would die for. But God looked down and saw all of us and said, somebody's got to save them. Somebody has to save them. And he knew from the beginning of the foundation of the world that Jesus would be the one. God said, look at that soul right there. Look at that soul in their sin. Look at that soul in their lostness. Look at that soul. It has more value to me. It, it, that, that soul right there means more to me than all the trees and all the clouds and all the raindrops, all the sand of the sea, all the stars of the sky, all the angels that are in heaven. That soul right there. Jim, you mean more to God than every molecule that this earth is made up of. Every, every bit of it. Lincoln, you mean more to God than every, and there are, they're uncountable, than all of the stars that have ever been seen by human eye or by camera or from the astronauts in outer space. You mean more to God than every drop of water that is in the firmament and on this earth. You mean more to God than ever. Houston, I'm not quite sure about you. But <laughs> Houston, <laughs> just want to make sure you weren't crying. Um, uh, we all know that's Brother Dan. Uh, but we know, uh, listen, truly, truly, you mean more to God. Yeah, little old you, insignificant you. You mean more to God than the entire world and everything you see. You say, that can't possibly be true. That's what the Bible teaches. That's God's word. Jesus looked down, or God looked down and said, I will give my son in exchange for you. 
Isn't that a pretty rotten trade? That's why I want to try to live for God. <laughs> That's why I want to try to be like Jesus because Jesus took my place. God said, I will give Jesus in exchange for the multiplied untold masses that will be born into the earth and have to suffer through sin. Now, G now God won out because he gave Jesus the power over death, amen? Jesus, up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. Jesus got back up, so God won out. God knew what he was doing. God said, I'll give Jesus for a time. Jesus will be crucified and beaten and, and, and uh, set apart and reviled by men and cast out and, and spat upon and buffeted and beaten, bruised and battered so that Isaiah said that no man, could, you can't even recognize that he's a man. I will give Jesus, but hey, earth, I'm only letting you borrow him. You only have a certain amount of time to put your faith in him. If you put your faith in him, I will claim you to myself. But if you don't claim him, if you don't believe on him, if you don't put your faith in him, then hell is your destination for eternity and you'll never get out. Never. You only have him for a time. Take him while you can. Receive him while you can. God looked down and said, I'll give my son for that soul. I'll give my son for that soul. Have you ever owned something or had something that you thought was just a piece of junk and somebody said, oh man, don't you know what that is? Don't you know, I, I can't remember, it was one of the boys or maybe I had it and somebody said, I had a baseball card or a football card or something and um, uh, somebody said, man, do you, don't you know who that is? No, I, I don't. But there's, it's very, if you say a name, it's gotta be way before because I know enough about sports to like, Know the big names, you know. Uh, I've been to the Hall of Fames. I, I've paid attention. I've played the sports, so I'm I'm familiar with sports. But they said, "Don't you know what you have? Don't you know what that is?" No, I didn't think it was worth anything. What, what's that show uh, where they take their all kinds of antique road show? People walk up and they're like, "Hey, I've got you know this thing. <laughs> I've got this candlestick holder." And they're like, oh, yes, this was in um, uh, the Russian czar's daughter Anastasia's room. And you're like, what? You know, and <laughs> hey, but I found this picture. And behind this picture, I found this deed. And this deed is to a multi-million dollar property. And like, come on now. Why? Because you don't know what you have. A lot of people don't know what they have. Now, I've been through that. And you say, well, it just kind of looks like junk to me. I'm, I don't know what it is. And they tell you, no, that's worth a lot. That's an antique or that's valuable. That, that has this value. And you say, well, it just looks like wood or looks like iron or looks like, you know, uh, 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 whatever. It just looks like a piece of junk. But that's not quite it at all. In Luke 12, we find a story a man, about a man who's not very wise in appraising his possessions. He has a lot of things, all kinds of things. And he put value on those things that God says, uh, they have very little value, very, very little value. And he put value on those things that God said worth, uh, um, and he didn't put value on those things that were worth a lot. Luke 12, 16, he says, um, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Man, I got this big old harvest. What am I going to do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He's saying, I got no room to hold this stuff. He said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and I will build greater. There will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things, uh, those things, then whose uh, shall those things be? which thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So is he, get that, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, please understand, God didn't say, thou fool, tonight thy soul shall be required of thee because he had a rich harvest. And he didn't say, thou fool, uh, 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 because he said, I'm going to have to pull down barns and build bigger ones and, and, and say, You're, you know, tonight thy soul is going to be required of you because he was going to build bigger barns and because he had a great harvest. There's nothing wrong with big barns and there's nothing wrong with a great harvest. It's your attitude towards it. It's what you're going to do with it. What was he going to do with it? He said, I'll store it up. I'll store it up. I'll take my ease. 
I don't need to plow next year. I, I'm good for years to come. I don't need to work anymore. I don't need to put in effort anymore. I have arrived, but you don't know famine's coming. You don't know a flood's coming. But for this guy, he didn't know death was coming. God, the Bible in this parable, Jesus is saying, you don't know that death could be tomorrow. Do what's right with what you have today, with what you have today, and let it count for something. Let the, the, the plentiful harvest count. Let the material count for the eternal. Let the temporary count for the eternal. He said, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Is not rich toward God. Verse 20 said, but God said, but God said, see, this man took an appraisal of all his stuff. He said, I've got the cars, I've got the house, I've got the wealth, I've got the health. I've got all this stuff. It's all mine. I have it. I'm good to go. But God said. See, we go around in our life and say, we say, look at all the things that I have. Now, I don't know of any rich, overflowingly rich people. You know what? I don't, I don't know of any Wealthy people. No, I don't, I don't know of any people in here who say, I have it all. I've got everything I want. I've got the, the wife has her car and I've got this car and we've got our sports car and we've got the mansion and we've got the cottage on the lake and we've got the boat uh, on the pier, you know, at the lake and we've got all that. I don't know of anybody that, that has that here. I actually know of some pretty great examples of people who say, hey, we have overage. We have abundance. How can we be of a help? That's so encouraging for a young pastor and for a, a, a church to, to have that. And there are people who say, these are my talents and abilities. I could go out and maybe make a career out of them. But uh, until the Lord opens doors for that, I'm going to use them where I can at the church, how I can at the church, and I'm going to do the best job that I can. But God said, God is the appraiser, not you. God is the appraiser, not you. So this man was very wealthy according to the parable and according to his appraisal. But the Bible says that he was a fool because he did not properly evaluate the things in life. He said the harvest is valuable. No. Tick, 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 tick. If you listen close enough, every thump is a tick. Thump, thump, thump. That's valuable. That's valuable. Come here, Luke. Come here, Houston. Come here, Lincoln. Hurry up. You know what these guys are in life right now? They're takers. And I don't mean anything about that. They're takers. Look at you. Your hands are in your suit jacket pocket. Dr. Harrington would be yelling at you right now. You don't do this, folks. Don't ever put your, don't do that. Stretches out, looks sloppy, don't do that. Uh, but, and look, at he's got his shirt tail hanging out. <laughs> Lucas's buttons, he's unbuttoned. His, you got button down collars and he's not buttoning them. It's Sunday afternoon. They had a hard day, you know. Uh, uh, but these guys right now, are, they're, they're takers in life. They take from mom, they take from dad, they take from their grandparents, they take from their teachers. They take, they take, they take. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. This is a phase in life. It's very natural. But to me, they're more valuable than anything else more valuable than anything else. And they, they make me mad and I have to yell. I have to yell at them. I have to tell them to clean their room. I have to get in their face. I'm telling them, boy, you better straighten up and don't, well, it's not you. Don't talk to your mama that way. And this guy right here, he's an angel. Oh, um, that's where's your halo? How do you hide your halo in wings? Uh, uh, but these guys are valuable to me. They don't bring any value value. Uh, monetarily, uh, a tangible value. They don't work jobs. They don't, they don't bring anything to the table, but they sure take everything off of it. Uh, uh, and, and I've got five of them. The other two are growing, amen? Uh, but um, uh, these guys are valuable to me. They may not be valuable to the world, but they're valuable to me. So every thump, every beat of the heart, every breath I take in and I exhale, Every tick of the watch is time. Time is valuable. Stuff isn't. Go ahead and, and sit down. I, I believe, thank you guys. Um, now see, they brought something tonight. They, you guys brought an, an, a quick illustration. Uh, what happened was I was just lonely standing up here by myself. Uh, I believe, I, I, I hope I have it right. 
Um, Dr. Bob Gray was a kid, and uh, they were moving, and they lost everything in a fire. And, and he stood there with tears in his eyes and, and as a kid in despair. And his mother said to him, don't worry, Bobby, God didn't burn up in the fire. You see, you can lose it all, but God didn't burn up in the fire. God didn't burn up in the fire. See, Kirsten might have lost her movement, but God didn't lose his. God didn't lose his. And you say, well, how is that supposed to make me feel better? Well, you're his child, aren't you? He's capable of all miracles, isn't he? Well, yeah, and, and yeah, both, yes to both of those. And you believe that God can do anything? Yes. Okay, do you believe that God has a purpose for you even if you don't, you don't run again and you don't play volleyball again? Well, yeah, I know that. Okay, well, then that should give you comfort when, say, it's, when, then, when you say that God hasn't lost his movement, God's still on his throne tonight. God's still on his throne and he'll be on there tonight and tomorrow and the day after and the day after. God will never be off his throne. What does that tell me as, his, as a a child and a soldier and a steward and a servant of the most high God. It tells me that he's in control. And if I have placed myself in his hands and I abide by this book with, by obedience and by faith, and I try to line and line up with the word of God, then I know that he is in control and I don't have anything to worry about. I don't have anything to worry about. And we can be like the, dece the, de the disciples, the, the disciples, amen. We can be like the disciples on the storm-tossed sea there in those oceans and go, oh, well, God, where are you? Or we can go, man, I'm getting kind of seasick, but I know God's in control. I'm tired of the wind, and I'm tired of the mist, and I'm tired of the waves, and I'm tired of the, the darkness and the clouds, and I sure would like some, some, uh, uh, some, some uh, 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 consistent wind in my sails and a nice sunny day, and I sure would like that, but... I know the storm, we're in a storm, but I know God's in control. I know he's in control. And we can get out of that boat and walk by faith. But God said, but God said, he is the appraiser of what's going on in our lives and what is valuable. See, this man had temporal things valued higher than the eternal things. So you and I tonight, we need to accept God's appraised value that eternal things are worth more than the temporal things. I don't believe anybody in here would even attempt to refute that. The eternal are so much more valuable than the temporal. If we're going to balance life, balance life. I tried um, uh, balancing. I've got different things that I do to, for my balance. Um, it's good for your core. It's good for your back. And it's good to have a, a decent balance, especially climbing up and down on the truck and the trailer and the things that I have to do. It requires a decent balance. If we're going to balance life, we're going to have to do it with purpose. We're going to have to have joy. We're going to have to have meaning. We're going to have to have, we're going to, have to learn what is valuable and what, not, what isn't valuable. What is valuable and what isn't valuable. Uh, I noticed some of my habits before, and nothing, nothing necessarily sinful, um, but I noticed some of my habits uh, would, would bleed over to the kids. Like, I'd always look at houses, and I'd always look at cars. I, I, just, I just like it. I'm not coveting. I'm not lu lusting. That'd be weird. I'm not coveting. <laughs> I'm not coveting. I just think it's cool. I'm a, I like cars, and I like, oh, man, that's a neat design. I like different architecture and things like that. That's a cool design, and, man, that's neat. And, and it's just giving me ideas of what I'm asking the Lord to make my property like in heaven. Um, you know, just Lord put me on the back 40, amen, with a big old stocked pond and, and uh, just don't put the fish that swallowed Jonah in there. I don't want to end up in the whale of a belly, uh, the belly of a whale. Uh, <laughs> that's a whale of a belly. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to end up like that, amen. Uh, but um, uh, you can add that to a blooper reel or something, I don't know. Uh, but... Um, uh, uh, so I, I look at those things and, and, and I'd notice that when I would start looking at him, Houston would, that kid's like right on my shoulder all the time. Would you look at me? Get away from me. <laughs> Remember how we do that with the comics? Dad would get the paper and we'd get the comics and somebody would be reading them. One of the siblings would come and say, you get a chance when I'm done. Now go away. You're breathing on my neck. It's weird. <laughs> get away from me. Uh, but I'd notice and he, he would, 
oh man, if we could have that, if we could go there, if we could do that. And, and Lucas is always looking at cars and man, this is what I want to get. And Brother Hiles said, look, the best way, I, I heard this message some, some years ago. I don't even know if I heard the, the whole thing, but he talked about that, that, that desire to want more. He was talking about being content. He said, if you want to be happy with what you have, go to a place who has less than you have. Stop, if you, if you have a place, if you have a $100,000 house, don't drive through the $300,000 house neighborhoods. Don't go to the half a million dollar house neighborhoods. If you got a $300,000 house, there's no, there's no need in driving through the one million and one and a half million and $3 million house. Why? So you can covet? If you've got a car that runs fine and is decent and you keep it clean and you, God gave it to you and you let it to you, you change the oil on it and you keep the air pressure in it and it gets you to where you need to go safely and it plays what you need to play, and it goes, and it turns, and it does everything. And I understand maintenance and everything. But you, you go through life, and you do those things. Be happy with what God gave you. Don't go to those places. Brother Hiles said, if you live in a $100,000 house, go to the $50,000 house neighborhoods, and drive through there, and say, dear God, thank you for the house that I have. So I stopped. Now, no, that, you kids don't need to look at that stuff, and, and then I don't need to look at that stuff. I don't need to look to, because immediately, here I am, it's a, a year and a half after I have my car, and I'm like, hmm. Hmm, something big. Come on, man. Now that I haven't had my car for six months, it'll be like having a brand new car once again. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, these things aren't valuable. The car could crash. The car could crash. It's not, it's, so what? All right, so replace it. Brother Dan, the car could crash. <laughs> Woo, amen. Um, uh, uh, so the, what's valuable in life? What's valuable in life? So think on uh, the major areas of life and their eternal value. And I'm going to close with this. Uh, our walk with God has lasting value. Our walk with God has lasting value. God is just a, um, uh, I know he's near. I know he, he dwells with us. I get that. But he's um, in a distant, we're in a distant relationship with the Lord. Because, because we, of course, he's on his throne in heaven. I know he's everywhere at once. But you have this walk with God. And one day, the Bible says, our faith will be, or the song does anyway, our faith will be sight. And scripture uh, promotes that. Our faith will be sight. One day when our faith is made sight, when we see the one who saved us, when we see the one who created it all. The Bible says in Genesis, and it repented the Lord that he had made man. It repented the Lord that he had made man. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah walked with God. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and was not, for the Lord took him. What about eternal value of our homes and our marriage and our children? I don't mean the, the, the structure of our home, but I mean the, the, uh, uh, the inside value, what our homes are. What, what are our homes? Broken and in turmoil and places of despair and sadness and yelling and cursing and, and, uh, 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 and violence? What are our marriages? What will our children be? What about those things? Those are valuable. What about the value of our work? Putting, saying, these are my hands. This is, God has given me a work to do. I don't care if you drive a truck or you're a janitor or a maintenance man or a computer, uh, or you work in IT or you uh, uh, used to work in printing or you're a cook at a school or uh, you, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you do, uh, Hallmark cards and digital, or, and, and coding, not coding, yeah. not coding, trans, transcription. Transcription or, or, or work at McDonald's or work at Kelly Box or whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Work. Your work has value. You may say, but this, this isn't a career. This isn't a life changing man. I want something more. I want to do something more. All right. Well, then work where you are, like you're doing it for the Lord, and let the Lord give you a promotion. Let God promote you because the Bible says promotion comes from above, not below. Promotion comes from the Lord, not from man. So no matter what you're doing, let God work out your path before you. You just work like you're supposed to work, like you're doing it for the Lord. So what about the value of the responsibility that we have to ourselves? Every, a lot of Christians say, you know, oh, self-neglect, self-neglect, self-neglect. That's stupid. That is, that's stupid. If you can't love yourself, then you can't love others. If you can't treat yourself right, you can't treat others right. Now, the world has taken it and ran with it. Self-love means... Uh, uh, permission, self-permission to do anything that you feel like. And that's wrong. 
Uh, but, but the important thing is, is, is that we take care of ourselves so we can do the will of God. Take care of ourselves so we can do the will of God. That's why I try to, uh, I, I don't eat perfect, um, uh, but I try to eat better. Uh, I don't eat, and I still have stuff I'm not supposed to have necessarily, uh, but I don't have as much of it. See, I'm, you quit eating that or quit drinking that. And I'm like, I'm not going to stop doing that at cold turkey. I'm not a cold turkey kind of guy. Uh, it took me years to get into it. It's going to take me years to get off of it. Um, uh, you know, quit something cold turkey. No, but I, no, I do. I, I do want to take care of myself. I, and that's why I, I, I try to uh, cardio or exercise or push-ups or whatever the case is to, to allow myself some room <laughs> to be able to eat that brownie. Amen. Uh, but it's important we take care of ourselves. Why? So we can do the will of God. Take your medicine. Take your vitamins. Get enough sun. Don't go out in the cold. You know, do what you're supposed to be doing. Take care of yourselves. A lot of people want to be healthy just so they can have more fun. How about be healthy so you can do the will of God? Do the will of God. I asked Houston today, I said, Houston, what kind of dad do you think I am? I said, if I'm dead and gone one day, what kind of dad will you remember me to be? He said, well, when it comes to work, I'd say an A minus. <laughs> what? He said, well... I mean, like, you want the job done, but you're not going to be mean about it. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll take that. That's an A-plus to me. Um, uh, and he said, when it comes to, what did you say, fun, you gave me a B-plus? A B-minus. A B-minus. I'm like, come on, fun? He's like, yeah, because your idea of fun is not necessarily our idea of fun. I'm like, all right, I'll give you that. Fun to me is like, Sweatpants, sweatshirt, on the couch, cozy blanket. Watching Andy Griffith, you know, <laughs> with a can of Pringles and a, you know, a Mountain Dew or something. <laughs> Do what? No, no, that's not fun. Uh, uh, that's my idea of fun. Can we go get up and go do something? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> permission. I give you permission to have all the childlike fun you want. Um, and then we got in the party. He's like, but funny. He's like, oh, you're really funny. I like when, you know, you're a funny dad. And I said, yeah, I am kind of funny. But I, um, uh, uh, I like being fun. I like having fun. I like doing, I like roller coasters and I like shooting guns and I like driving fast. And I like, um, uh, uh, I don't, Lucas and I want to jump out of an airplane. I want to fly the plane. He wants to jump out. Um, uh, and and uh, just make sure your insurance policy is up and, you know. Uh, but uh, it, it's not just to have fun, but it's to do the will of God. But you can have fun doing the will of God. I can't tell you how many uh, uh, youth activities and um, senior class trips and high school class trips and uh, uh, tra ba traveling basketball and volleyball team trips and uh, uh, all the conferences and all the things that we've done and experienced and been and all the great times that we've had in the will of God. I remember one time we were at Mackinac. I said I would close. I'm closing. I remember we were at Mackinac and uh, this was a, Brother Alex, this was a um, high school trip. When would we take that? Late September? No. October? Columbus Day. Columbus Day. Uh, so we'd go in October. Er early October. And um, uh, it, we would go to uh, it, the Mackinac Island. And it, beautiful weather. And uh, my dad, we'd bike rental every year. Every year they give, they put in new bikes or they can, they, brand new brakes and things like that. And my dad, we went up to Arch Rock. Arch Rock is a beautiful spot to oversee. And uh, well, let me see, that would be Lake Huron. Lake Mich yeah, that'd be la overlooking Lake Huron. And... Um, uh, uh, we got up there and, and my dad is coming up a hill and then the hill has a decline and you can really pick up speed. And he was flying down this hill. I don't know how fast I'd say, what, at least 20, yeah. 25 on a bicycle, which is pretty quick. And he wanted to hit the back brake and slide in like he was in school, you know, back in the day. He did not hit the back brake. He hit the front brake. And he went, I believe I can fly. <laughs> right over the handlebars and everybody, the whole, everybody, high school is sitting there watching. He whew, 
flew through the air, he landed on the ground, busted up his shoulder, rolled into some leftovers by some horses. Um, and he got up and, and he was hurt. And he knew he was hurt and everybody there knew he was hurt. And there were probably 100 people up there, strangers included. And he got up and rode his bike down the hill. Now, for him, it wasn't fun, but for everybody around, it was fun. Watching things like that happen, uh, all the, all the uh, uh, experiences and all the memories that you'll carry through life that you can look back on and have no regrets about and not feel ashamed about and not have to, the Lord saved me from this. When you thought you were having fun, I have nothing to feel bad about having fun in the will of God. Christians, you don't have to go out to the world to find fun and to find satisfaction. You can find it in the will of God. So it's important that we put the proper value on things that are truly valuable. Now, here's the question I want you to think about this week. Think about this one. Evaluate. Evaluate. Evaluate your time. Evaluate where you spend your time. Where do you spend your time? On what do you spend your time? I want you to leave here tonight with that question, and we'll get into some more of this next week, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I, I th- I'm always, I guess you could say a little more, I'm not necessarily down, Lord, but I, I like Sunday mornings. I wish Sunday morning would last all day. I wish the, that we would just take a break in the afternoon and just continue it. Um, Sunday nights come to a close. I wish Sunday, uh, Sunday services, everything from Sunday school to Sunday morning service and um, uh, ensemble singing and special music and the offering and the fellowship and all the way to Sunday night. Lord, I, I, I wish it would just last and last and last. And Lord, so I look forward to heaven where it will last forever. I know it won't be a church service the whole time, but we'll be only with God's people in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus, all saints throughout the ages. Lord, I look forward to that. My heart longs for it. Uh, But Lord, while we're here, uh, life seems to be a a puzzle so many times and we get distracted. Sometimes we invest our time and our efforts into places that are not valuable in any way, shape, or form. We have taken our stewardship and the talents and gifts that we've been given and we've, and we've invested them into things that won't bring a return. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us. Help us to invest in the eternal. Oh, Heavenly Father, I, 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 I long to see everybody here rewarded substantially in heaven to see uh, that we did things biblical, that we did them right, that we're a church that you could smile upon and and bless over and over and over again Uh, because we adhered to the word, we obeyed it, and we tried to live by it and preach it and see people saved. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we come to a close in just a moment, and I know I... Uh, What about an invitation? Uh, Oh, people would have an invitation every day on their knees in their closet with the Lord. That everybody would have a time with the Lord, not just wait for the Sunday altar call. Lord, our church needs you. Every day we need you. We need guidance and we need discernment and wisdom on how to do things and run things. And Lord, I'm so grateful for the faithful folks who come here and I don't have to lean on them so much. And there's folks here that are just on, and I mean this in a good way, they're on autopilot. I don't have to check up on them every time to see if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're on it. And Lord, what a blessing that is for this young preacher. Uh, Lord, I'd ask that you'd give us safety as we leave here. Um, Lord, I would ask that you don't take a soul from this place in 2023 not from moving and not from passing on to heaven. Oh, Lord, I, I don't want to keep anybody out of heaven, but Lord, I'd like to keep everybody here. Uh, we'd actually like to add some souls to this church this year. 
Help us, Heavenly Father, to do your will, to invest in the valuable eternal things. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed. <laughs>